It was the first day of the week. The Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John agree. Our early church proclamation is clear that the resurrection of Jesus is the inauguration of a new creation. The, interestingly, the Genesis story is told by means of clay and God's mighty breath is said to breathe into the clay to become a living being. The Genesis begins with the darkness and void. John tells how when it was evening, the doors are locked in fear. John Dominic Crozen, a theologian, makes a clear that in the first century, when a nonviolent messianic figure was crucified, the authorities did not kill his followers, since the followers did not pose the threat of violence. But the soul were drawn into the garden of Gethsemane. The disciples were locked it away in intense fear, but also grief. The risen Christ passes through the door to the upper room and the inner doors of lust and fear. Jesus whispers a benediction of peace. Incredibly, the next message is not one last parable or story or set of instructions. John says Jesus showed them his hands and his side. The risen Christ shows them the wounds of crucifixion. Christ reveals the wounds of being human. The good news of every life is God works through the scars to bring newness of life. Here's in John's creation account, the focus is embodied in a new way not through clay, but as a first fruits of a new creation. God works through the scars to bring newness of life. Why would a God who makes all things new, why would the God who created it a rainbow, or a God who could stack up the waters of the Red Sea, why would this God not clean up not perfect this body with the scars. If God wanted to resurrect Jesus' body to inaugurate a new creation, to rebuild power and newness of life, why wouldn't God use a perfectly new body? Why keep the scars? If God wanted it to be credible to the Romans, or to any who doubt God's exclusive greatness. Why tell the story of God's power with the scars in his hands and sides? The disciples are comforted to know that this is the same Jesus they had known. Jesus, the human, is here as a risen Lord, here in the continually and yet new life to reveal an eternal God, breaking into the order of life to upend the power of death and destructive empires. This is the same Jesus who told us God swept the floor, lit a lamp, or looked until every lost coin were restored. This is the same Jesus who would have us consider the release, how they are walked on and stand up again, how they neither toil nor spin, and yet God cares for them. This is the same Jesus who would turn his cheek and die on a cross rather than suggest the world could be redeemed by violence. Love doesn't give up on the brokenness in life, or toss out the imperfect. 
that God loves our life in ways that continue them, redeem them, and use the scar to proclaim that there will be a newness only God can imagine. And this is the work of God's new creation. So now the disciples see him and know him differently because God works through the scars to bring newness of life. John tells that the other disciples couldn't wait to tell Thomas, who was maybe out getting groceries or coffee or something or getting a new phone. They tried to explain their experience of Jesus. They experienced Jesus as a living reality. Our eternal God was a present in Jesus. The Thomas was hesitant. But here is the curious thing. Thomas doesn't ask to see Jesus with a new body. He asks us to see a Jesus with the scars. Why? Every one of you is probably all too well acquainted with the scars. So am I. I've been with the families who have lost their parents, with those who have experienced a tragic accident, with those whose lives have been torn apart by fire or storm. I've been with too many parents who lost a child. I've been with the victims of a senseless violence of war. I've seen a boyfriend playmate blown to bit as we stood by the seashore in the wake of Korean conflict. He reached it out to pick up an object floating near the shore, which turned out to be a bomb. I lived it under a brutal military dictatorship. I've heard the outcry of families separated by the Cold War through violence and because of unjust immigration laws. Most of us protest. I don't want this pain. I want something new and perfect. I don't need this scar. We want a God who takes away pain and sorrows and scars. We sit in nursing homes or hospitals or living rooms locked it in fear. And in our sorrow, we wonder what is next. We wonder if we can bear the pain, and if so, live with the scars that remain. There are several observations I like to share. The first, the God has a relentless passion to transform our human poverty and brokenness. The God chose to offer signs of new life by means of a poor Jesus, one from an occupied land to reveal the limitless power of God. Life together, especially in the covenant with the God, requires that all people have the material conditions that makes it possible to live with dignity, independence, and self-respect. And the justice and righteousness of a society is measured by how it cares for its poor. In recent years, a number of theologians have come to speak of God's preferential option for the poor. In the heritage of my own culture, this has been called a Minjung theology, a theology that celebrates the values of every human life. One of the pioneers among those writings from this context in Latin America was Gustav Gutierrez, who writes, quote, begin, God has a preferential love for the poor, not because they are necessarily better than others, morally or religiously, but simply because they are poor and living 
in an inhuman situation. That is contrary to God's will. Quote end. The poor are the beneficiaries of God's blessing, the object of God's program in the world. Because of poverty, is a failure of a moral imagination. We have a collective responsibility to ensure that no one would be excluded from the shared graciousness of the community and its life. The God has a relentless passion to transform our human poverty and brokenness. But secondly, God does not use the perfect, but the imperfect to proclaim hope. The God uses the scars and pains of life to reveal what God can do. Today, social media puts pressure on the young to have a perfect bodies and the perfect lives and the perfect relationships. But God uses the body we have the lives we have lived it, and the relationships we are in to make Christ known. God uses our mistakes to tell a redemption story. God uses our fault and failings to proclaim. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Paul says it, this way, not many of you were wise by human standard, not many were powerful, not many were a novel birth, but God chose what is the foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Let's also be clear the newness of life and gifts of the Spirit's peace is the basis of our call to ministry. In Genesis, the human was told to be fruitful and multiply. In this creation story told by John, we're given the power to retain or forgive sins. The fruits we are called to produce is a restoration of the relationships that reveals the Spirit's power. Jesus sends the disciples to forgive and engender new creation. This is the good news. God calls imperfect people in imperfect relationship to proclaim forgiveness and hope. Any one of us who have experience of loss or fear or scarring can proclaim the power of the risen If God can use anything to proclaim the power of God, why can God use anyone? Why couldn't God use our LGBTQAI communities to proclaim love and acceptance? Why couldn't God use an imperfect church to proclaim the power of God? Why couldn't God use our diversity, race, gender, or ethnicity, to remind us the God's church is a sign of harmony and equity for all people. The lastly, the good news is that God can use my scars and use God. I thank God for such a mercy. In my quiet moments, I can let God in and let God see the blemish of my life. When I was a boy, my family was impoverished. My father was sick and disabled. Neither was socially acceptable. I was angry and the scars were deep. When I was locked in fear, Jesus met me and said, I can use these wounds uh, for your promising future to hear and restore and proclaim hope to others. So your suffering and theirs is not wasted. The wounded Christ 
came into my wounded life. And I found a new wholeness in my life. Not despite, but because of my scars. We are not our top 10 mistakes or an illness. We are not our job loss or our regrets. We are the clay of a new creation. We pause long enough to note that the Thomas reaches out to touch and to learn and to understand and to follow God to bring him comfort. Maybe today, God can create impact in us for all the losses of COVID, the loss of life, the loss of capacity, loss of jobs, and the loss of trust in each other. This is a time for empathy, compassion, and the comfort God intended it for Thomas. This is a time for us to offer the ministries of comfort, healing, and love. This is a time to acknowledge we are all human and all of us have losses and fears. Then Thomas said, my Lord, my God. He believed it. His life was changed. He went from being a doubter to an apostle. New life was shared in community, and this story becomes our proclamation of power of God. May we risk reaching it out for new experience of the risen Lord. May we be apostles of God's newness by being honest about how God has used it, your scars. Thank God. Praise God. I believe God has a relentless passion to transform our human poverty and brokenness. I believe God does not use the perfect, but the imperfect to proclaim hope. I believe God works through the scars to bring newness of life. Amen. Amen.